Welcome to Feeling the Chill, Stretching the Organic Garden into the Fall with Al Johnson. Um, before we get started and before I introduce Al, I just have a few announcements to make. So we are presenting, attending, and hosting this workshop from land that was managed and inhabited before European colonization. Please take a moment to find your location on this map and honor the land uh, in, uh, honor those whose land you now occupy. And we will give you a link to this map if you don't have it already in just a minute. Um, and we just wanna encourage a few ways that you can center racial equity in your own work, assisting BIPOC, ed, BIPOC led organizations, supporting legislation that will begin the conversation and advance the work toward reparations and protecting the rights of farm and food workers. So we're all very good at Zoom at this point in time, but just a few reminders. Um, you will be muted when you come in to this session. So to unmute yourself, simply press the microphone icon at the bottom of your screen. Please mute yourself when you're done speaking to avoid background noise. Uh, feel free to use the chat feature to comment at any point during the workshop. Um, Al may take a few questions during the workshop and he will also save time at the end. Um, and you can feel free to put your chat questions in at any point. And I just want to remind folks that this session is being recorded. As always, we wanna thank our sponsors. We couldn't pull off this conference without support from all of our gold sponsors, as well as our silver sponsors. Please make sure to support these businesses if you can. We do have an online auction. I will also put this link in the chat. We've got some excellent items there, very exciting options. So check that out. We even have a microscope in the auction this year. And lastly, um, check out our virtual vendors. If you have the program book, you can see videos from these vendors in our program book. And we do encourage you to support all of these vendors either during the conference or throughout the year as you plan for your garden or your farm. Okay. So I'm just going to turn things over to Al in just a moment. I would like to just introduce Al who is among other things, the president of NOFA New Jersey, is that right? Vice president. Vice. Um, and you may have seen Al last night. He created an amazing documentary for us, which debuted last night. Uh, also, Al has been growing organically for over 45 years, including 12 as a farmer. His current garden, managed entirely by hand tools, provides most of his family's produce. Something is harvested 12 months of the year and he uses no growing devices. He has also been an inspector of organic farms since 1990. So Al brings a lot of experience Thank you so much for joining us, and I'm going to turn things over to Al. Thank you, Jocelyn, and uh, glad to have everybody here on what is a very nice day in, in New Jersey. So speaking of New Jersey, I, uh, I can't remember my zone number, but I'm central New Jersey. I'm not near the coast, so pretty much the same climate, I think, as most of uh, southern Connecticut, the uh, Cape Cod area. Uh, because it's a little bit relevant. Uh, when I give you dates, you may have to adjust them a little bit for those that are in Northern Vermont or um, you know, Northern New Hampshire, whatever. Uh, so just, just keep that in mind. Um, but I will try to, um, uh, try to uh, you know, give, give you as many dates in my area as possible. And, and again, just adjust them. So I think I can go ahead and share screen, right, Jocelyn? Yes, go for it. Okay, and where am I here? Are we on? Yep, looks good to me. Okay, so just a quick run through. Why are we doing this workshop? Well, uh, I, I feel with um, uh, any garden, uh, you have the opportunity to not just grow for the summertime when it's warm up, but to really extend your harvest into the fall. And I'm talking about 
Uh, let's see, why am I not advancing? Oops. Okay. Sometimes you need to click on the presentation. There you go. Okay, thanks. I'm talking about uh, you know, harvesting lettuce like this in November, uh, fall brassicas that can be harvested right up to Christmas and beyond, uh, overwintering kale, uh, harvesting kale that was planted this year, next spring. Uh, I'm talking about harvesting a lot of things for storage for the winter time. And I'm talking about trying to uh, keep other things in the garden over the winter, such as carrots, uh, and how to store them. I'll give you a couple tips on, on how I can store things, and some of them may, may apply to, to many of you. Okay, so uh, well, the first thing to, to take into consideration is your sunlight. Some of you may have uh, situations where you don't have, you just barely have good sunlight in the summertime. It may be more challenging for you to grow in the fall. However, there are, are other situations where you have uh, restricted sunlight in the summertime because of the trees. Whereas in the fall, some of the, the um, sun, sun is on a lower plane in the horizon. So you might actually have better sunlight in the fall. Uh, so keep that into consideration when you're, when you're listening to this. The other thing is water. Um, you will need water. But for those of you that are in a little bit of challenging situation for water, such as some community gardens where it's got to be delivered by, by a watering can, uh, the, the ground stays moist a lot longer in the fall than it does in the summertime. So your watering needs are actually less critical. Um, I'm going to start out with, uh, by going through a few crops uh, that can be planted this time of year uh, and uh, you know, talk about them one by one. Okay, the first thing I'm going to talk about is scallions. Um, this time of year, you could buy a bunch of scallions at a store, cut off the tops and use the tops, and then plant these into the ground. Uh, and by probably late October, this is not an October shot, but by late October, you should have scallions that look pretty much like this. Now, there's another way to do that for a fall crop is if you've already planted scallions, you can cut them rather than pull them out of the ground. And two days later, you'll start to see some sprouts. Two weeks later, you've got the beginning of a new plant. This is two plants here, one that which is not cut and the one on the left, the very left part, it's a little plant there, but it's starting to grow. And that's about 10 days after that was cut. So you see they, they actually have a pretty good root system at this point and can put up quite a bit of, uh, gr of greens quite quickly. So just as an aside to that, um, this would be that uh, in the back on the right is a scallion that was probably cut in July. And that's the second growth right there. Uh, the ones in the front are scallions that uh, were not cut. So it's, again, this is not really fall planting, but those are leek size by now. If you don't pull those out, they're, they're, they're this size and you can use those as you would regular onions. Okay, so let's go to crop number two, which is carrots. Um, I'm very specific about how I plant my, when I plant my carrots. Uh, and how I plant my carrots. Uh, I make a very, uh, uh, what do you call it, very uh, shallow trench. And I sprinkle the carrot seeds in. Some of them will be in the bottom of the trench. Some of them will be on the sides of the trench. And I go back and I just pat, I don't actually push soil in there. I just pat the top of it. So some of them actually get covered and some of them do not. I plant some extra seed figuring that uh, sometimes when it's uh, you know, a week of moisture after I plant the carrots, the, um, the ones that were not quite covered sprout well. Sometimes if it's a little drier, the ones that were covered sprout well. So I, I seem to get a pretty uh, uh, a more consistent stand by using that method. Um, if you have a way to cover your carrots in the summertime, uh, summer planting, uh, I, I would recommend it. You can use a shade cloth. Uh, if you have a um, floating row cover that you've used for other things, uh, you can cover it for about a week and it, it creates a more consistent moisture for germination. Now, um, floating row covers are probably not something you can buy at a, at a typical garden store, but uh, until I started teaching these workshops and actually would bring them to and give them out, I actually uh, would go to uh, local farmers and ask them for their old 
torn up uh, row covers because they needed those to be intact, probably for protection of insects. I just need a little bit of shade on my soil. So that might be a source of um, uh, row covers that you can use for moisture protection. Now, when to plant. <clears throat> I like to plant carrots um, about a week before the new moon. That's a philosophy of biodynamic gardeners. It's also probably something you can find in the farmer's almanac. Uh, the new moon has more water movement within the moisture within a seed, uh, just the way it does on the ocean uh, tides. And I do find that I get a little bit better and quicker germination. So to get what I consider to be really good fall storage carrots. I plant a week before the new moon in June. Sometimes that's the beginning of June. Sometimes that's the end of June. Doesn't seem to make too much difference. Um, you, you now you could probably do it in July. I don't know if you're going to get as big of carrots. Um, you might ask, is it too late to plant carrots now? I would say it's too late to plant carrots and get good storage carrots for the wintertime. You might be able to get small carrots. I've never planted this late. Um, but you could give it a try. So think of this as, as for next year, uh, try to remember those dates. And I don't even think that would vary depending upon what zone you're in. I, I would think that would be pretty consistent from zone to zone. Okay, uh, chard uh, is another one I plant at the same time. Uh, I don't think the, the moon cycle is quite as critical, uh, but again, that can last well into the fall. This is the late fall planting. You can see some of the leaves are starting to, to uh, I'm sorry, it's a late fall harvest. Uh, some of the leaves are starting to turn brown, which I, it seems to be typical of chard, but uh, again, it, it can be harvested well into the fall. And the other thing that I like to plant a lot of is beets. Um, again, I plant them the same time I plant the carrots and they're a little bit quicker growing. I can usually get a you know, couple harvests earlier in the fall, but I can also save them till a uh, later harvest for my winter storage. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, good. Sorry. <laughs> Get stuck everyone's on. Um, the thing about beets, if you're new to, to the, this crop, the seeds that you plant are actually multiple seeds. So quite often you'll have them coming up in twos or threes. You can see by that quarter there, there's, there's two, two beet plants just above, two just below. If they're that close together, you really need to thin them out. Um, if you don't have space in your garden uh, that time in June, but you still want to plant beets, you can also plant them inside or in pots. Um, and these can be planted in clumps. I thin these to, to three plants. Uh, I know people that do four. And then I plant those about every eight inches. I plant a clump about every eight inches in the garden. So I do not have a really good uh, facility, I guess, or house, whatever, for planting. Um, seedlings in the springtime. I just don't get enough sun and I don't have artificial lights. But summertime, it's a little different story because you can actually plant these in a, in a window. And then as soon as they start to germinate, you can put them outside on a picnic bench or uh, in front steps or something uh, if you have a good, you know, a sunny spot. Um, okay, next uh, set of crops is going to be lettuce. Um, throughout the growing season, I plant lettuce every three weeks and I continue that until August 20th. So August 20th is my last seeding of lettuce. And that could be seeding directly into the garden, which I do, or you could, you could seed in pots uh, inside, and, uh, but, but the same day. This particular planting, this particular year, I was experimenting with planting a little bit later. Um, there's actually three plantings of lettuce here. The one under the row cover was planted on August 30th. Uh, the one in the middle, the kind of small plants, that was planted on August 15th. And the ones at the top were planted on uh, August 1st, I believe. Uh, so we'll, get, we'll, we'll see these as they mature and see um, what, what the difference is. And uh, again, August 30th, lower ones, but I now recommend not planting any later than August 20th. They, um, they take a long time to grow. So if you have a large space, you can harvest that August 20th planted lettuce for a long time. And basically we usually eat lettuce for right into January. Okay. 
Okay, this is this is that same shot with the row cover taken off. You can see those uh, seedlings are probably a, a couple weeks old and they, they need to be thinned. If you don't thin them, uh, particularly in the fall, you're gonna end up with leggy plants like this. Um, this is still edible. It's probably getting a little bit bitter, but um, the competition for light is a little more intense in the, uh, in the fall. So they tend to get leggy or a little bit easier. So again, these guys need to be thin. This is a good time to do it when they're an inch or two tall. Um, so this would be that same patch. Uh, I guess it's just a little closer, closer look. Um, this is that same patch in the middle of October. Uh, I think this is, this is the middle uh, of those three plantings. The one right in the front is the one on August 15th. So they're, you know, they're good size. Uh, you can start harvesting those. You can thin them out as you harvest. The others will, will continue to grow. Now with, um, let's see, with fall planted lettuce and probably with all crops, you'll get good growth um, right through pretty much the end of uh, September. After that, the growth will really start to slow down. The growth slowly, we'll get an Indian summer, which will last for a few days, up to a week, maybe 10 days. And they'll get some more growth there, but basically your growth is very, very slow after that. So it's important to get those in by August 20th, because if you get them in later, uh, the, a day in October is probably the equivalent to a half a day in, in August. Uh, just because of the more, uh, you know, the, the additional heat and uh, the uh, more intense sunlight. Um, now, can I pause for one second? Sure. Um, we do have some lettuce questions. Okay. Um, do you want to take them now or do you want to hold off? Uh, yeah, just for let me, a little bit. give me five more seconds. So, so this is uh, okay. November, uh, I think it's November 18th. So again, you know, decent sized uh, heads of lettuce. Uh, and again, this is the ones that were planted on uh, August 15th. The ones in the back, you can't really see them. They're a little smaller. Uh, again, the experiment of that late, later planting wasn't completely successful. Go ahead, Jocelyn. I'm gonna do a quick check-in with our interpreter, make sure he's doing okay. And do you need Al to slow down or anything, Nick? He's doing okay. All right. <laughs> we just ask people to, you know, be, be aware of the interpreter as we go. So thank you, Al, for your um, awareness of that. And thank you, Nick, for interpreting. Um, there is a question in the chat that says, um, our beets form leaves, but never form a decent sized fruit. Any suggestions? And then uh, a later question, our beets never get larger than marbles. Do you want to address that, Al? Yeah, um, sounds like they're almost the same question. Uh, I, I mean, if I planted late, I would only get marble ties and, and leaves, but I find planting on that date is fine. Um, I would suggest that you do try planting in pots because I seem to have gotten a lot better beets since I've started doing that and transplanting outside. Um, and it, it, it um, beets seem to be a crop that you plant, you think you've got a good stand and they start disappearing. I think it's often the birds. I think birds will, will peck away. Now that doesn't have anything to do with, with only getting greens. But I mean, something that, and in general, when you only get greens, it, it is an indication that there's too much nitrogen in the soil. Um, but you know, I'd have to you'd have to test the soil. Well, that, tests don't always test for nitrogen. But um, uh, you know, maybe you could add a little bit of a, a organic potassium in the way of green sand or something like that. Try that out. But I would I would try going to the pots. I just have had much better luck since I've been doing that. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, and then a quick lettuce question here: Do you cover lettuces to harvest until January? Well, I'll get into that. I'm going to talk about harvest a little bit later. So yeah, good question, but I, I will get into it. <laughs> okay. Excellent. All right. Thanks. Yep. All right. So uh, the next crop I'm going to go into is turnips. Um, uh, when I moved to New Jersey, an old timer told me that plant, I need to plant my turnips on August 8th. If I planted before then, I would get too many root maggots. If I planted after then, I wouldn't get good bulbs. 
So again, you can adjust this for your, your growing zone. Um, but I think at that time of year, that might be a, a pretty good um, indication. It'll probably work for all of us. I actually talked to uh, Ruth Hazard, who was the uh, uh, entomologist for UMass for years, because they're a little bit different climate. And she, yeah, she said it probably would apply to most of Massachusetts also. And uh, so August 8th, I plant turnips. I direct seed them. And uh, they're pretty quick. I think these are 10 days old. Um, and going back to that root maggot, this is what root maggot damage will look like. Um, I would say that I'm seeing more, I think I'm seeing more root maggot damage in the la last few years. I have a feeling it has to do with, with the climate change. Uh, and I don't know exactly how to adjust for that. But um, uh, this little hole here might also be a root maggot. Uh, the, the bird in this one seems to have done a little more damage. Uh, a lot of the times that's not uh, that's not an, a serious issue for a gardener. It would be for a farmer because they may not be able to sell this for full price. But most of the time that will be a small area that can be cut out once you, you cut the turnip open for, for eating. <laughs> um, so Turnips, and I could also would say that this would probably apply, the same schedule would apply to a lot of the uh, uh, Asian greens. Um, these are the turnips that are planted on uh, August 8th, and this is September 14th. So at this point, I probably thinned out a little bit, um, but now I'm gonna come in and, and do a more serious thinning to, uh, you know, and, and these are great, greens at this point, it's five weeks and uh, you know, uh, a nice crop of greens, but I'm gonna harvest them as thinnings because I want to let the other ones remaining get to be decent sized bulbs. Um, these are bulbs a month later, I think it's October 13th, um, they're harvestable. I think they get sweeter as they get bigger and the, and the temperatures get colder, but they're certainly edible and they're certainly a, a good size to, to harvest. Uh, um, this, this is the same patch and it has been thinned of greens and it's the end of October. As you can see, the greens start to deteriorate a little bit. They lose their quality by the end of October. So at this point, I'm only harvesting the greens as I harvest the bulbs. There, there's edible material in the greens, but there's, it's not that beautiful um, green pass that it was a month ago. Okay, so this is going to be a fairly long section. I'm going to talk about other fall brassicas. So that would include, in, in my particular situation, it includes uh, kale, cauliflower, broccoli, uh, and cabbages. Um, I like Brussels sprouts, but they need about a month more of growing time, so it just doesn't fit into my, my rotation. And of those Four crops I mentioned, cabbages are the ones that are most challenged by, by using my, my planting schedule. So this is what I'm trying to do, get, get a nice green patch like this by, of fall brassicas by the end of October. It is snow on the ground. It was one year we had a late snowstorm. Uh, and again, I buy seedlings early on, but this time of year you can't usually find seedlings when you need them for, for fall brassicas. So I start them inside in a windowsill and I move them to a sunny location, a uh, fairly sunny location. Uh, this is an ideal one, it faces south. And if a, we have a thunderstorm or hailstorm uh, predicted, I can move them under the, the porch so they don't get ruined. This is the day after a hailstorm actually. It's why those leaves are in, in the uh, ground. So planting schedule. Um, I like to plant in pots uh, July 1st. I planted as late as July 5th and it done fine, but I, I find a little bit earlier, you know, they seem to do a little bit better. And then I, again, I grow them, I put them out on the, uh, on the sunlight. And when they're ready to transplant, I, I have raised beds and they're about three and a half foot wide and I plant two rows, offsetting the plants in triangular pattern. Now, you might not have a place that's this open on, uh, when they're ready to plant, which I should mention, they, they, they need to grow in those pots for about three to three and a half weeks. So this would be the latter part of July. And if you don't have a space like this, 
Um, that's fine. There's, there's other, I'm going to talk about some other alternatives. Now think about, uh, you may have some early lettuce that's come out of the ground. You may have uh, peas that have already come out. So there are usually spaces in, in most gardens. Um, and uh, the other thing that I've gotten into in the last few years that works well with my rotation is I plant them in the onion bed before I harvest the onions. Now, this was just taken yesterday. That's a seedling that's probably been in the ground for about a week. And the onions, I probably need to get them out this weekend. But my, onion, my onions, I plant three rows to a bed. The brassicas, as I mentioned before, I just plant two rows to the beds. That means I can plant them between those rows of onions and they get about a, you know, maybe a, a week or two start while the onions are still there. And I can, I can pull the onions out without disturbing the, uh, the brassicas at all because their roots haven't gotten that, that large that they're anywhere near where the onions are. So um, you know, just think of innovative ways where you can uh, kind of intercrop and, and uh, get those fall crops in. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the pests. The European cabbage worm, who's, this is the butterfly. <laughs> uh, I guess it's called the European cabbage butterfly. I'm not sure. Um, you'll see them all over the place. You can't get rid of them. They will lay their eggs on your brassicas. Even when they're in those pots, they'll find those pots on your front steps and they will lay their eggs there and you, you need to start your controls um, early. So this is what the worm looks like when it gets a little bigger, but the little tiny worms, uh, they're hard to see. You can actually hand pick them. You can squash them, um, depending upon how many plants you have. If you've got a fairly large patch, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, if you've got a fairly large patch, I have a, uh, a uh, spray routine of Bacillus thurgiensis, most commonly called BT. Um, and I also use a substance called spinosad, which is a, a bacteria, I believe. Um, and I alternate them every 10 days. So I will, will spray every 10 days. And you know they, the, um, uh, the eggs will have, have hatched before or since the last spraying, and they may get some really small holes, but the, um, both those things do a very good job of controlling. I prefer, know they had that going on when this is going on. Yeah, I prefer to use the BT. Um, just because it doesn't affect any of the other, other insects. The um, spinosad might be harmful for some of the predators. I'm not positive about that, but just a little bit of a caution. So if you only had one, I would use the BT, but I'm just wor a little worried about resistance uh, of the um, caterpillars to um, BT. So that's why I like to switch. Okay, the other problem in the fall is going to be slugs. Um, and you might not know you have this problem. If you're in a community garden, for instance, and you're right next to a parking lot or some really uh, shortly mowed grass, you probably don't have a slug problem. If you don't use mulch, you probably don't have a slug problem. Um, but they, they can, you know, if they find your garden, they can build up if the situation's right. You'll only find them maybe on rainy days, but you're much, much more likely to find them at night. So what I do is, uh, well, I'll get into that control. Um, there, there's a multi, uh, I, I guess I'd say multi-pronged approach I have to slugs. Um, I happen to have a lot of um, box turtles or wood turtles in the, uh, that uh, live in the woods right next to us. And I think that's the source of the slugs, the fact that we're so close to a, a wooded area. But, whoa. Okay. Um, but I, um, so I, I encourage that. The reason I, I, I know they eat slugs, that my son has a reptile book. <laughs> so I looked it up. Slugs, uh, slugs or snails are their favorite, one of their favorite foods. So, and they seem to park themselves right next to the fence. So they're getting slugs that are coming either in or out of the garden. It's not going to be a complete control, but it helps. Um, okay. Uh, the second uh, with, uh, method of control, which I find very effective, is, is called sluggo. It's ferric phosphate. It's it's allowed for organic uh, use. I think it's it's basically a, a lightly processed mine mineral, as far as I know, and um, it comes in these little pellets. Um, I have read that it may be somewhat tough on worms, so I don't use this. Uh, I, I use this judiciously, I guess you could say, or, or sparingly, um, and I I surround the the plants in the pathways. Uh, I don't want to affect any worm population. Now, 
I have dug up areas where I had applied this the previous year in the pathways, which I don't expect to find a lot of worms. Um, and I found a very good worm population. So I think if it, it does have a negative effect, it's very minimal. Again, it's called uh, Sluggo. It's available through probably most good suppliers of organic seeds, of, of seeds. Johnny's, um, High Mowing, uh, Fedco. They always have um, other items that they sell, and this is one of them. And I found it to be very effective, by the way. I, I held off from using it for a long time, and I started using it, and it, it really is effective on slugs. Um, so if you, if you don't have a big patch and you don't want to use Sluggo, uh, you'll need to go out at night with a, a good headlamp, and you'll, you'll, you can find the, um, uh, the slugs. And uh, this is a stage shot, it's not at night, but uh, I take a little popsicle stick and a jar of white vinegar. And I just brush them into there and it seems to kill them almost instantly. Uh, again, it's a lot of hand work and you've got to do it at night. You'll never find them during the daytime. But, um, and the last thing I believe is um, a uh, slug trap. Now you can use probably a, uh, a paper cup or a tin cup in the same method, but um, bait this with beer. Uh, you could also bait it with water that's got yeast in it, but they seem to like beer. I actually find that uh, Belgian beer seems to attract them better than others when I set several of these out. And I think that's because it's a higher alcohol content, probably higher yeast content. Um, if you wanna make it a little more effective, you can add a little bit of, of yeast to, to it. But the, 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 um, the way these work is the, um, the slugs will climb into the, the cup on the bottom and they'll actually, they can't turn around. They'll, they can only go forward and they'll drown in the beer. It's maybe not a bad way to go. But, um, I, uh, to make these a little more effective, I have a couple of scrap copper pipes and slugs will not touch copper because it's some, it's some kind of reaction to their slime, I guess. And uh, so I just, make a, a V and face it towards the direction I think the slugs might be coming from. I think I may get a little more this way, but um, they'll catch slugs. They won't get rid of them, but they will help control your population. Okay, the last thing is um, more of a long-term solution for slugs. And in my particular case, I collect leaves in the fall and I basically store them in the pathways between my raised beds. And on a really cold day in, uh, let's say, December or January, one of those real clear, crisp days when it may get above freezing, but you can tell that temperature is going to drop into at least the teens that night. I will rake some of those uh, leaves in the pathways into piles. So I've got some exposed ground uh, where there was a mulch. And I can see a few slugs in there. And what I'm doing is I'm exposing them to the, the freezing temperature. You've got to do that right before the sunset or maybe even after sunset. And so I did, I did a little experiment. I took a couple of those slugs and I put them on a piece of paper on a picnic table. And they started crawling around a little bit. But when, you know, as the temperature got colder and colder, they just stopped. It was too cold for them. And so I came back the next day to see what happened to the slug. And it was still in the same position, but I couldn't tell if it was dead. Uh, so two days later, I came back and yep, it's dead. So that, you know, again, that's a system that can work and help control slugs in the, in the long term. Okay. Um, so back to my brassicas. Um, this is uh, my brassica bed, which includes my turnips in the front and the transplanted seedlings of kale, broccoli, etc. Uh, in the background. And this is uh, August 15th. So the, the, the turnips are just small seedlings. And those uh, guys in the back have started to catch on. I probably planted them, you know, somewhere around July 25th or transplanted to the garden. So they've been in there for a couple of weeks. I started to develop some roots where they started to catch on. Uh, okay, and uh, this is um, mid, uh, mid September. Um, uh, broccoli in the front, kale in the back. You could probably start harvesting a few leaves, although I let, really like to wait harvest kale until it gets much colder. The, the leaves just get much sweeter. Um, this is um, a month later. It's about the middle of October. And again, kale is in the front. That's some nice harvestable leaves there. 
And we'll take a look at the broccoli. Uh, can't really see it that well from here, but I'll take a look at it in another minute. Uh, you can harvest the kale or, or leave it, either one. Um, so this is broccoli from a, you know, this, this planting system, and this is um, October 18th. So by the middle of October, you're going to be harvesting broccoli, and um, uh, you know, hopefully you get some. If you got some lettuce too, you, you're going to be flush with vegetables by this time of year. Okay, so getting back to my favorite crop, which is kale. Um, this is, I'm not sure it's the same year, I think it is, but this is the kale patch. It's probably about six or eight plants. Uh, and this is uh, about November 20th. So this is when these things really start to get good. When you get uh, frost at night, the, the leaves are really sweet. Now, if you look on the, on the left-hand side of the, um, of the patch, You'll see a leaf there that's that's yellow. Um, that's normal. As they produce new leaves, the ones on the bottom will die. So that's an incentive for continuing to uh, to pick them from the bottom. Um, if you don't, uh, you're going to lose some leaves. But again, the ones that it's producing at this time of year are much sweeter than they would have been in that uh, early uh, mid October shot we saw. Okay. Whoops. Okay. So the last, uh, not, I guess it's not the last, one of the last crops is a spinach. Um, and you can plant spinach for over harvesting, uh, I'm sorry, over wintering. And I've used the same timing in, when I lived in Vermont and I've used it in New Jersey. So I think it, it's, it's pretty consistent. And that is to um, plant your spinach on September 15th. You won't get very good, very much growth in the fall. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think this is probably around Thanksgiving time. Um, but uh, if you mulch these, uh, don't cover the actual greens, but mulch around the plants, uh, you'll get spinach like this in early May. It's not that much of a jump on, on your, your early lettuce crop. And I found it's maybe only a week or 10 days of a jump on spring planted spinach, but it is a bit of a jump. Um, one thing to note here, if you don't mulch those, um, they may overwinter, but they're more likely to die, not from the cold, but it, you've all seen uh, instances of frost heaves in the springtime where the ground, open ground cracks. And that is a result of the cold nights, the, the uh, frozen moisture expands the soil and then in the daytime it contracts it. And it can break the roots of these spinach plants. Uh, a little bit of mulch, you don't need a lot, a little bit of mulch will, will pretty much prevent that. Okay, and the last thing is um, garlic. Uh, people can give whole workshops on garlic, but uh, it's a, a fall plant, planted crop. Um, pretty consistent, I think, in, throughout the Northeast to plant in late October. I shoot for October 20th, but I've planted into early November and you know, still getting a decent crop. There seem to be other factors involved whether or not the crop is big other than the planting date, but certainly the planting date is, is, uh, is uh, somewhat critical. Okay, so now I'm gonna, uh, well, actually, um, Jocelyn, any more questions that relate to that? I am gonna get into late, late harvest and post-harvest handling. Yeah, um, I don't think there are any questions that are you know, urgent in this moment. Um, somebody asked a question and somebody answered it in the chat. So I think you can keep going. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Uh, okay, so I want to talk about uh, late, late harvest. Um, you can harvest all, any of those crops, you can harvest throughout the fall, but there's some of them that really do well in, in uh, late harvest and for storage. Okay, so I'm going back to the scallions. These are the scallions on uh, one year, on uh, January 1st, and there's still edible scallions in there, but the quality has gone way down. So these probably should have been harvested a little bit earlier. This is another year, um, and this is mid mid-December. Uh, it was, uh, actually, I think it was December 20th. We had 12 days of continuous sub uh, free, uh, freezing temperatures, and it did a lot worse. So it, it's a little bit of a, of a uh, chance if you leave them in probably past early December. Um, but this is uh, a harvest of carrots and turnips on December 26th. Uh, some years I get them out earlier and some years I can leave them in. I think the reason I leave them in so long is because I think they store better in the ground if the conditions are right uh, and I have more space in the ground. Um, I, I happen to have what I found to be a pretty good storage place for these root crops and we live in a, in a house with a basement and has stairs going outside 
and I put them in this area, close the door, and um, put them in, uh, yeah, put them in perforated plastic bags. Uh, they, they should not be inside of sealed plastic bags because they, they will start to rot in there. But if you have ones with preparation, um, you know, probably this things you, you buy other things in the store that are in perforated bags. Um, these are ones that Ziploc used to make specifically for, for winter stores and don't make them anymore. Right? <laughs> okay. Um, but um, yeah, the, the, I've never had them, I've never had any loss from freezing yet. Once I get those bags set in place, I cover them with, a, you know, any blanket sheet. Uh, the, uh, the coffee bags you can get from local roasters are, are really good for this. Um, that's the, uh, the top of the stairway. If, the, if you can keep a snow cover on there, it's, that's that much better because wind can, can leak into that. Um, I call it a bulkhead uh, and possibly lower the temperature. Uh, but again, I've done this for 15 years and never had any loss. Um, one other way you can store them is over winter in the garden, particularly carrots. I think I've, I've tried it with other turnips and beets and not has so much success. In the first few years I tried it with carrots, um, I had some, uh, quite a bit of loss too. And I, I realized it was not from the freezing temperature, it was from the freezing of wet soil. So I have these scraps of um, plastic I got from a dairy farm. And I, I cover the, uh, the patch over the winter with this. Um, and, and basically what it's doing is just keeping that soil from getting overly saturated. Just pull it back, rake back the leaves. You can see the little carrot sprouts starting. This is probably um, late March. And then they go up. Um, I believe I, I did this with a late planting of carrots. I, I said it may be a little bit late to plant storage carrots, but I think if you use this method, um, these carrots were not that large. They didn't seem to be large enough to harvest when I uh, did my other ones, uh, you know, late late December. Uh, I kept them in the ground, and those are not huge carrots, but they're they're decent sized, and it's nice to have fresh carrots in March. Oops. Okay. Um, uh, Mm, mm, I guess 14 out of 15 years that I've we've been in this location, I've gotten really good lettuce throughout the fall. But there was one year, 2013, particularly we had some bad cold snaps early on. And this is still November, and I started to get a lot of this browning in the leaves. And I think it was because it was so warm, such a warm fall, that I was getting some really tender new growth. And then we had this really, really cold snap. Um, and gut damage, but you can see it's damaging some of the leaves, but there's still good growth in there. Um, I think this was a question earlier on, do I ever cover my lettuce? Uh, yes, I do. This is um, December 13th, I think. And I, I, some years I do, some years I don't. I think maybe it's a little bit better if I, if I put a, like this is a flannel sheet. One of those floating row covers I think is too thin to provide much protection. Uh, but I pulled it off and this is what it looked like three days later. Uh, you know, I just, we, um, again, I don't use it every night. Um, but this is that year that you saw earlier where I had three plantings of, of lettuce. I think the one in the front is the middle planting and the ones in the back are the last planting. They're kind of small. Uh, that's the size they were. And there's edible lettuce there that just didn't get very big. So again, uh, August 30th is too late. August 20th is much better. Uh, now, sometimes they will get covered with snow. Uh, this is going to be like that 2013 where we had um, had another cold snap in December, it really got cold. And I had too much lettuce out there to harvest. It wouldn't have lasted in my refrigerator. So I did cover it with a, a, um, a, a sheet. Um, and then I pulled it back 10 days later and this is what it looked like inside. I couldn't quite tell if it was alive. But I brought it, I harvested some a couple days uh, later after it had a chance to recover. And there's still a lot of edible lettuce in here. There's dead leaves on the outside, but um, you know, we're, we, um, we were eating this in, into December. A little bit of browning on the uh, midrib, I think you call it, but uh, you don't have to eat that part. Um, and then some of it I left in the ground and about a week later, this is what it looked like. It really had recovered. So, um, you know, it, it's a lot more hardy than you actually think. Um, as a little aside, I often plant cilantro the same time I plant my lettuce seedlings. And this is what it looks like. It was not covered during those 12 days the snow lasted. 
Um, and when it melted uh, a couple of days later, this is what it looked like. There's a lot of brown cilantro in there. So we picked it and we had to kind of pick through it, but um, a lot of edible, uh, you know, edible greens. So um, I want to talk about frost on some of the other crops. Cabbage is um, quite resistant to frost. And I you know, grew them into the fall when I lived in Vermont pretty successfully. Um, most of this top part of the, the top layers of the cabbage can take quite a bit of frost. If you think of cabbage, um, it's kind of a rubbery. And so I think it has the ability for the moisture inside each leaf to, to expand and contract quite well. What will happen is if you get three days of sub, uh, sub freezing weather, maybe the high 20s might not be too bad, but uh, the frost can get into what I call the growing point. That's the growing point right in the middle, if you can see my cursor. If that gets frozen, that's gonna die. And the plant will start to rot from the inside out. And you really won't know it because you can't really smell it. I think we've all smelled rotten cabbage before. You don't smell it until you harvest it and you, and you cut it open like this. But um, yeah, I just look, look at the weather report. If I, I see the weather, it's gonna be below freezing for three days without going up. Freezing at night is okay, as long as it goes back up above freezing in the daytime. It's that constant below freezing that will get to that growing point and, and can, can kill the cabbage. Um, if you're harvesting cabbage in the fall, uh, don't forget these big leaves. This is generally what the plant looks like after I've harvested the head. But a lot of the, the um, things we harvest in the fall are for soups and stews and things like that anyways. And there's a lot of edible, there's a lot of edible plant material in these things that normally get left by most farms or even by gardeners. Um, <clears throat> this uh, particular kale plant, it's one plant, it's taken the same day as you saw those old other um, six new kale plants, but this one is 16 months old. It's been through an entire winter uh, and it's been through an, uh, another growing season. And that's a lot of kale on there for something that's been in the ground for 16 months. And I'm going to go through uh, how I did this. Okay. The one problem you might have when you're overwintering kale into the next spring is aphids. I don't get them every year, but I occasionally do. Um, and I, I, uh, I'm not going to I have a, a, re, uh, a theory why, but I'm not going to get into that whole story. Um, they can fairly easily be controlled with safer soap. I mean, you can rub those off. You probably get most of them, but safer soap does a good job of, of uh, killing them. And safer soap is just a soap. It's, um, you know, it's perfectly safe. Now, what the safer soap will do, it will kill them in place. So you need to go back uh, maybe a day later because these will start turning black and brown um, when, they're, when they're dead. Uh, go back with that spray bottle of just plain water and just spray them off. Otherwise, they're, you know, <laughs> they'll start to rot right on the plant, which you don't really want. Um, so, uh, okay, this is again that, that 2013 where we get some really uh, uh, rough weather. And I've got three types of kale plants here and uh, I'll show you why I'm putting them in. Um, you can see over here, I call this uh, Italian kale, I think. Um, there's a lot of brown leaves yet. They didn't come through those frosty uh, nights uh, that, that really cold spell very well. Uh, the um, Russian kale, red Russian kale in the middle, um, kind of drooping leaves. Um, Looks okay, not, not quite as good. And the, the um, curly kale, uh, my particular variety I like is winterboard, but there are a number of, of others. Um, looks quite a bit better, but I'll show you a little more close up. Uh, again, the, the Italian kale, and if I, uh, okay, a little close. Okay, this is back to the Italian kale. Remember when we looked at that growing point on the cabbages? Well, the kale also has a growing point too, but it's at the top of the plant. And after that really severe weather, this turned, turned brown. Now, again, it only happened one year, but um, it, it, it'll, it'll show you the, the, the hardiness of these things. Um, and that did not grow anymore. I, you know, I had to harvest those leaves and, and basically the, the plant was true. It was the same for the Russian kale. That's the growing point, it turned brown. Um, the curly kale came through it quite a bit better. You can see that that's green. I had a, several of these. Um, it was a little bit brown on some of them, and, and, and I found that um, not all of them winter, but the point I'm trying to make here is if you're going to, to overwinter, um, the, the curly kale seems to be the most hardy. Uh, this is what that patch looked like 
uh, the next spring. They're all, all dead except for the one in the background, um, which is the one we just looked at. That's the curly kale. Um, that started to grow again, but I'll show you what also happened to those, um, the ones that looked dead. They started sprouting new sprouts from their base. Now, at this point, you might say, I need that space to plant lettuce. I need that space to plant, um, uh, you know, whatever, peas. Uh, because this is actually uh, late March, uh, maybe maybe into early April. So you may just want to get rid of these if they didn't come through. But you also have the possibility. Uh, uh, let me, let me uh, go ahead. Uh, you also have the possibility overwintering them. If they overwinter well, uh, you can harvest them in the snow. You can clear the snow away. You can harvest them. Uh, it's a tradition of us to have kale on Groundhog Day every year. Um, and a normal year, this is what that patch would look like in March, in the end of March. They're starting to grow new leaves up the top. Um, these leaves might have been on all winter long. Um, you know, I've been harvesting them all winter long. And um, this is probably that patch you saw my wife, uh, one of these plants. Um, uh, um, my wife was you know, in front of these plants when they were young in the, the, past, um, uh, the past fall. Uh, you know, nice healthy plants, and then what will happen is they start to they start to change. They start to grow tall and leggy, and they will start to put out little florets. Um, that's what I call them, uh, kale florets. And all three types of kale that I have planted will do this if they overwinter. Again, just the the, the curly kale seems a little more more consistent about overwintering, and we basically will eat these about every other day with a patch that size of about six plants um, from probably early to mid April, right until we start to harvest lettuces in, in, in May. Um, they're very productive. If you don't keep picking them, they will, they will turn yellow and start to produce flowers. They'll, they'll uh, produce seeds, but you want to, you want to try to prevent that from happening. If you keep picking them, they will keep putting out florets. And they're very tasty. Uh, you know, you get a bowl like this. Uh, you can eat them raw. You can cook them. Um, that's you know usually our our night vegetable. Um, so I want to go back to those uh, uh, the um, Italian kale that we saw that we had died, but you saw little sprouts coming from the bottom in in early April. Well, I let a couple of those sprouts go, and they actually produced new plants. So. Um, the, uh, the crop was not lost completely from, from the, uh, the, the winter cold. Um, this is probably in, um, in uh, late May, maybe early June. Now what will happen in, um, at the solstice, basically at the summer solstice, the plants will stop producing those florets. And you may have cleared them out already to put in you know, your tomatoes or something like that. But if you, if you keep the plants in there, um, they'll stop producing those florets and then they'll start producing new leaves. And the leaves, uh, you know, they're, they're tender. I, I like kale better in the winter time or, or late fall, early spring. They, they're tastier, they're, they're sweeter. These are not as sweet, they're more like a summer kale, but they'll, they'll get um, uh, tall like that. There's a little bit of trick photography. There's a tree in the background, which is not part of the kale plant, but they'll get to, to be my size. Um, the quality, uh, I think, of the, the kale kind of goes down here, but you can keep that plant in and keep harvesting from it. And, um, the other thing you can do is you can cut that um, at the bottom, leaving about a foot, which is what I did with that one that you saw my wife with that I said was 16 months old. Um, and it will start to produce new sprouts like this. Uh, that will produce a new plant by the, you know, by the fall, it's a full size kale plant. Uh, again, that's a repeat of the, of the um, photo we saw before, but that's probably that you know, that, that same kale plant that we saw earlier at 16 months. And it's one plant right there. So I think, Jocelyn, that's it. I can stop sharing. And um, if we have questions or discussion, that would be great. You have a couple of questions in the chat. Thank you very much, Al. You packed a lot of information into that one hour or so, even less than an hour, because we started late. So. Um, thank you for that very informative overview. And I love all the, the pictures. It's really helpful for me as a sort of visual thinker to see what you're talking about there in real life. Thanks. Appreciate it.
Um, we do have a couple of questions already in the chat. Um, so if people have additional questions, you can start posting them in the chat now. I'll keep an eye on it. And Christine, who is our backup host, will also keep an eye on the chat and we will ask the questions out loud and um, Al will answer as best he can. Um, so the first question was back from when you were talking about garlic. Um, and the question is, can you plant garlic now? Uh, I would say no. I, I'm not sure why. <laughs> uh, it's, it's just recommended to, to plant it in um, late October, mid to late October. I think maybe it will start to, it, it will start to produce green, um, which will die over the winter time. And then it won't produce a good a, a good clove in the uh, uh, next for next summer. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, and then Laura is wondering about specific varieties of lettuce that you would recommend. I'm assuming for sort of extended season. Um, Laura, I don't know if you're still here and if you want to ask anything further about that question or um, if I got that right. Yeah, I, I can I can go into the specifics. Um, uh, I mean, I, I'll tell you what I. I uh, plant a, I think it's called a red fire from Johnny's, um, and uh, and then a green leaf, which I can't remember the name, but but I, I like to use the the, the loose leaves for the uh, fall planting. Um, summertime, I I often plant a Batavian um, variety, and uh, I think magenta and Nevada are two varieties, but uh, I don't find they do as well in the fall, so I I, I have stuck to the um, uh, the, the green uh, and, and red loose leaves. And I'm sorry, I can't remember the, <laughs> the name. I'll, I'll remember it before we're in of the, the green leaf I planted, but uh, you know, any, any good uh, fluffy uh, green leaf, uh, I think will work well in the fall, or, or uh, loose leaf, I should say. Loose leaf, great. Okay, thank you. Um, Priscilla is wondering, have you tried hoops to hold floating row covers off the plants, especially to prevent fall pests on kale? Um, I haven't, but I would think it would work. Uh, the only, my only issue there is when you start getting later into the fall, your sunlight is, your challenge for sunlight. And I think flooring road covers cut out about 10%, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's some, somewhere in that vicinity. So, uh, if you are challenged for sunlight and other, or other reasons, such as sun going behind a house or tree in the fall, um, that may be a little challenging, but I would think particularly in early fall, it, it would work. And I don't know if any of you noticed, but when I showed that picture of the onions uh, with, the, with the little transplants, um, there are already some holes in that leaf. Um, so you, you, you've got to start your controls early and that would probably prevent that. Now, um, one of the reasons I don't plant brassicas in the spring is because um, flea beetles are hard to control uh, and they don't bother me. The flea beetles are gone now. Uh, and then practically gone. Um, so that's one pest I didn't even talk about because I, I don't, I, I deal with it by just planting in, in the fall only. So yeah, I, I would think that would work. You might have to take them off uh, again when the sun starts to get low. I, I would think when you get that um, Indian summer in October where you do get some good growth, I'm not sure there, there's an advantage to having them on there, but it would, it would save you from having to control um, the pests in other ways, particularly cabbage worms. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, I'll pause in case Priscilla wants to add anything. And if not, I'll go on to the next question. So we have a question from Lynn. Um, Lynn says, I have, oh, there is, oh, okay. Actually, I'm going to go on to Priscilla and then I'll go back to Lynn because Priscilla does have a follow up here. Um, Flea beetle life cycle. When do they disappear? You know, I'm not sure. I have had flea beetles, and and, and if anybody can comment, it's fine. Uh, I've had flea, flea beetle issues with eggplant, which I just decided not to plant anymore, and um, and uh, spring brassicas, and I, I don't plant them anymore. Uh, again, when I if you use the the dates that I gave you, I just have not had a problem with flea beetles. I don't know how much you can push that back. I would like to try planting Brussels sprouts some year, but I'd have to start them in about a month earlier. Uh, they, they really need to be started in probably early June, start them inside 
in order to get any Brussels sprouts in. So some here I've to, I'll be able to tell you. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so I'm gonna go back to Lynn's question. Lynn says, I have all of my plants in pots. Any recommendations for insulating them? Leaves, row covers, question mark. So I, I take it, Lynn, you're keeping them in pots. Um, I'm not sure that the, you can winter them over. I mean, I'm thinking about, kale's the one thing that winters over. I'm not sure you can winter them over in pots, but I, I, I guess what you might be able to do is put them in a, a place where you can build up some kind of leaf or uh, shredded leaf or some other insulation around the pot and then, and then put them in the soil itself. Um, but if you can figure that out, if anybody has anything to add to that, fine. But if you can figure that out and maybe <laughs> get back to me in another year, see how well it worked. Um, I think that's yeah. the question. Maybe as best as I can. Yeah, I'll just pause. Yeah, um, in case Lynn wants to ask any follow up or if anybody else wants to chime in, I'll just keep an eye out to see if anybody wants to unmute and just jump in there. Okay. Um, we have a question from Katie. Do you have any experience with fall planting brassica to overwinter for spring harvest? Um, only with the kale. Uh, I found that um, uh, cauliflower doesn't overwinter at all. Um, bro uh, the broccoli, it, uh, you know, typically you harvest the, the large head and then you, you get some side shoots growing. And I have tried to keep those into January and I found that they, they freeze and um, you know, the, the plant basically dies. So I would say kale is the only one. Uh, I, I have not tried some of the, the smaller, um, uh, like, like the Chinese cabbages, Asian cabbages, um, uh, or some of the greens like that. Um, maybe one other one that, that goes quite well into the winter is arugula, which is a member of that brassica family. So that's something you could probably plant around the time you plant your turnips or even, even later, I think. Arugula is quite, quite hardy and I have harvested that in, in late January uh, without a cover, I think. So you know, the quality is not as good <laughs> and there's a lot of loss, but there's harvestable arugula there. Did that answer your question, Ms. Lynn? Um, so Katie, that was Katie and Katie says, wonderful, thank you so much. All right, um, I'm gonna pause again. If anybody wants to add additional questions in the chat, feel free to do that. Or if anybody wants to, at this point, just unmute themselves and ask a question directly, I'll just keep an eye on the screen. Um, if I see somebody unmuting themselves, I'll assume they wanna talk. Oh boy, we have a shy group here. <laughs> Yeah, we could stretch the season too. <laughs> I have a question. Um, sorry, I joined late, and so I, I'm not sure if you covered this initially, but have you ever um, planted late, done the fall harvest, and then tried to put in the uh, cover crop? Um, I haven't, but I have started planting cover crops in rows rather than just broadcasting. Because uh, I, I plant cover crops, I'm continually planting cover crops. And for instance, my uh, earlier planted lettuce uh, is in a bed right next to my, my spreading cucurbit. So the cucurbits are gonna take over that bed as I pull the lettuce out. And I always try to get a crop, a, a cover crop on that bed um, because it's, it's not being used over the summertime. So I've started planting in, in rows. And I think that maybe I could start doing that with some of the fall uh, crops, um, you know, some of the lettuces, as long as I kept them in rows that were between the, um, like the lettuces, for instance, I think that would work. And I'm gonna try it. <laughs> um, as far as, uh, like late planting, I think that um, your earlier fall cover crops, such as winter rye and uh, uh, vetch and you know other grasses like oats, 
Um, those are pretty quick growing, so you got to be careful not to plant them like too close to the uh, too much before the harvest because they'll they'll overtake. I think what I, what I'm thinking of is uh, trying it with small smaller uh, growing crops like uh, uh, clovers. Um, yeah, basically, basically clovers and seeing if that will work because generally there's not too much competition, I don't think, from a small clover plant when the lettuce is growing. Now, how well it'll overwinter if I plant them late, I, I really don't know. Well, let's try. Thank you. That's yeah, a really that good point. Thank you. Um, all right. And Priscilla is wondering if you could talk about planting peas for a fall crop. <laughs> um, I'm hesitating because I've not experienced that. I've, I've tried planting peas in the fall and not had as good a luck. So I've kind of I've kind of given it up, and so I can't give you specific dates. I have seen some nice fall crops. Uh, and again, I'm an organic inspector, so I go around to a lot of farms, um, and I, I don't know the the, the planting regimen for that. I have a feeling um, that it would um, probably need to be before August twentieth because uh, in the fall, I'm sorry, in the spring, I plant peas before I plant lettuces and uh, lettuces are ready before ahead of time. So I think it's a it's a longer growing season than lettuces. So maybe early August you could try it. And, and Priscilla, if you had if you get the um, Johnny selected seed catalog, um, they have a, they suggest a method of planting peas. Um, which I never noticed, and maybe it's new this year. They like they take a, like a, like a they tell you to dig a three inch trench, and just fill it with peas. And so I tried it this year, and I just got so much better germination than I ever have just by planting one, one seed every you know every two inches. So um, look at that catalog and think about using that that planting uh, method. Some of the other catalogs might have the same instructions too, but I never heard of it before. Great, right, thank you. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead just to Priscilla's comment and then I will go back to the earlier comments. Um, Priscilla says this might be a good year for fall peas since it's been cool and rainy. Um, and then I'll just go back. Um, Vivian is wondering about arugula. Um, if you do plant arugula, when do you find it is the op optimal timing and method? Um. Well, I plant them as I would other small seeded crops, which you saw that little, little picture drawing of the little trenches in a quarter inch furrow and just dropping the seeds in. Um, and they're pretty uh, quick to germinate. I don't grow them every year, but um, uh, I find, I, I, have, I can't tell you how late you can plant them, but I know I, I uh, plant them into August when I'm uh, planting my lettuce, uh, which is August 20th. Uh, with, with pretty good luck. Um, I think you can plant them early in that too. Um, and I you know, space them in rows, which I would, would um, other small crops like lettuces, uh, three to a bed, so they're about a, a foot apart, rows are about a foot apart, and it seems to be plenty of space. You might be able to get closer with arugula, but uh, I haven't tried it. Great, thanks. I'm gonna turn it over to Christine. She's gonna ask you a couple more questions. Rhea was asking about cabbage worms and wondering if you know how they lay their eggs. Um, do they do it on the ground or on leaves? Um, she said that they've had some issues managing them on in some years. Yeah, I believe it's on the leaves. Uh, I'm almost positive it's on the leaves, although I can't say that I can tell you what they look like. They're pretty small. Um, and I think it's on the underside of the leaves. Uh, yeah, so again, I haven't seen, they're tiny when they when you start to see them going around. So the, I, I take it that the, the eggs are tiny. Maria, do you have any um, questions you want to follow up with or does that answer it enough? Oh, she said, thank you. I can't recall finding eggs either. Um, Joan was wondering, she said, I have kale and chard in my boxes and grow boxes. You know, she's wondering if she should roll them into little or into her little greenhouse where the temperatures change daily or leave them out in the elements. Um, 
I would leave them out in the elements uh, because I think that maybe in the greenhouse, um, you, you're not going to get that cold temperatures to make them turn sweet. Now, are you, I'm not sure, Joan, are you talking about um, uh, now or later in the fall? I guess later in the fall, if they're movable, um, yeah, it probably wouldn't hurt to bring them in the greenhouse if, if they're in some kind of container. Because again, kind of goes back to that question about how well, well they'd overwinter in pots. I'm, I'm not really sure. If your container is fairly large, uh, you know, fairly well insulated with wooden sides or something like that, they, they might do perfectly fine in, in those containers. But if they're small and, um, uh, you know, where, where the, the frost is going to hit them from three, four sides rather than just from the top, uh, yeah, you might need to eventually pull those into the greenhouse. Yeah. Joan, do you want to add anything to that? Okay. Um, I was actually wondering about that too. Would it make a difference if there's snow cover over them just kind of act as a little insulation? Snow cover is fine uh, for, for kale. Uh, it, it doesn't mind it at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, the, the year where you saw the, the damage, there was snow cover uh, which covered the, the um, lettuce plants uh, bef before we saw that the damage in the growing point. Um, but the um, the other kale wasn't, well, actually it was covered with snow for a while. It was, it was a fairly thick snow, but that snow melted fairly quickly. Yeah, it, it doesn't buy. You, you saw me on, on Groundhog's Day. <laughs> I'll dig in the snow <laughs> to get the kale and the kale looks perfectly fine. It, it actually it actually helps, I think. And I've done that in central, central Vermont too. Great. All right, I think we have time for maybe a couple more questions if anybody um, again, if you want to type questions into the chat or just go off mute and feel free to ask a couple more questions here. So did you say you were farming in Vermont at some point, Al? I, I did, yeah. Uh, five or six years, I guess. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, anything else that you would like to add? And also, is there a way that folks could contact you if you are willing to answer questions? Sometimes sure. folks want to share their email in the chat. Um, that can be helpful, but if you don't want to, that's fine too. Oh, that's fine. Do I need to do that or can you do that? Uh, if you want to do that, that would be great. Um, we can just take a minute right now and, and uh, we're going to see. Yeah, if you want to just type your email into the chat, that would be great. And Christine and I are going to follow up with a couple of final announcements. We can still take another question if, if anything comes along. I'm curious, I'm not sure if this is something you covered um, at the beginning of your talk, but I was wondering if you just started on, on this by on trial by an error or if it was more of a directed kind of attempt to have crops lower, longer into the growing season and over winter. Um, I'd say trial by error. I actually, um, I think the first year we lived in Vermont, I didn't farm, I was gardening and uh, somebody had a garden and a neighbor's and they moved and said, so you can take care of my garden. and. Um, that's a long story. Uh, it was uh, it was Groundhog's Day, and I tried to drive my hour and a half into work, which I did once a week, and stayed stayed in a different area. And the roads were all ice. I couldn't make it in, so I turned around and came back. And I realized that the rain had melted some of the snow in the garden, and there was this, this beautiful kale. And so I went out and harvested the the beautiful kale. And you know that's how the this Groundhog Days tradition came about. Uh, and so I said, I could do this myself. <laughs> and so I just started doing more and more. And then the other thing is when, when I moved to New Jersey, I was farming um, near the Princeton area, which has a lot of nice restaurants. So I was growing a lot of lettuce for those restaurants. And I, you know, I had to try to stretch my season. So that's where I kind of get good at, at growing uh, lettuce as long a season as possible. Did I answer your question, Kristen? <laughs> Yeah, thank you. That's really interesting. Um, I'm sure that's probably been quite a process for you. And it looks like Joan has a, a question also. Joan, do you want to directly or ask it? It's more of a compliment. I just want everybody to remember that Al did that film that we all, many of us watched last night. He compiled 
50 years history of, of NOFA and spent months. I mean, he was all over all these states recording it. So I really wanted to go on record. Thank you on, on behalf of all the NOFAs and everybody should watch that film. Bravo. Al. Yeah, Thank I think you. everybody has a link to the recording last night, if I'm not mistaken. Is yes, right? it'll be out there forever, Al. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah and I want to make that available to all the state chapters too. We may have to do a little more editing. I saw a couple spelling mistakes uh, and we're, we need to do a little more work on the sound, um, but there's a lot of work that was done on the sound already. So do the best we can. Some, some are too loud, some are too soft. So. It was awesome, Al. It was a great video, okay. really informative. Thanks. Yeah, really. Um, so yeah, people will get that video uh, emailed to them, I believe at some point this week, if it hasn't already arrived in people's inboxes. Um, but that's sort of and the Chad collector's edition. And Chadley Cole. Chadley yes. Kolb did a lot of work from New Hampshire. So yes. thank you, Chadley, yes. also. Yeah, thanks, Joan. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, um, we do have one more quick question, if you don't mind doing one more uh, brief question that says, is it too late to plant anything for a fall crop right now? Uh, no, uh, certainly uh, turnips. Uh, I, I'm going to plant my turnips in about another week. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, lettuces again until uh, uh, August 20th. Uh, and you can plant those in pots on August 20th to transplant outside. You can plant trans direct seed them. Um, either, either way works well. Let's see. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess you could plant spinach uh, now for for fall for fall harvest. Uh, I, I generally don't tend to, but uh, I can. Cilantro, you know, other greens. Um, we eat a lot of cilantro. My kids grew up on cilantro. They'll eat it as a, as a vegetable straight out of the garden. So. Um, am I forgetting anything? Yeah, again, carrots, you could probably plant now, but you're not going to get a very big carrot in the fall. But if you can overwinter them in the ground, like, like I showed you uh, under some, some type of plastic that'll keep the ground a little more um, from saturating. Uh, yeah, you should be able to get some, some good carrots to harvest in March. Um, I can't think of anything else. Other, other Asian greens probably be okay. Yeah. All right. Well, once again, thank you so much, Al, for joining us. I know you had a busy, I'm sure you had a busy week, busy night last night, and thanks for joining us this morning as well. Um, we have a few just concluding announcements here. Um, Christine, if you could paste the map slide into the chat, I didn't have a chance to do that. Um, usually I do that at the beginning, but we got started a little bit late. Um, I would also like to ask folks to take a minute to fill out a survey. Um, just ask for feedback on the workshops and you'll be asked to fill out a survey at the end of every workshop. So it just gives us um, a sense of any feedback you might have. Um, Christine will post that in the chat. And just a reminder to check out our vendor marketplace, visit our online auction. Um, and the next workshop slot I believe begins at 2 p.m. So we have a little bit of a lunch break here. Um, you can leaf through the program book, see what you find there, and there's some videos there that you can watch with the vendors. Um, and just one more comment here in the chat. Vivian says, thank you, Al, for today's workshop and the 50-year oral history. We go back more than 40 years in NOFA, and the video was great. great. And another one says, thank you, Al, very informative as usual. Sounds like you've got a uh, long time fan club here. <laughs> my, um, my email address, I think, is in there. Yes, your email address is up there. If people scroll up a little bit above the links that Christine just posted. Um, so if anybody has follow up questions for Al, feel free to reach out. And also feel free to reach out to NOFA Mass if you have general questions about the conference. Oh, great. Christine just reposted the email. Okay. Um, well, thanks so much, Al. Thank you, Christine, for co-hosting with me. Thank you, Matt, for recording. And thank you to our interpreters for interpreting for us. And we'll see you at 2 p.m. Thanks. That was fun. <laughs>